Hi, and welcome to another session of Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University. Uh, today we're going to talk about gastroparesis, also called gastroparesis diabeticorum, the weak stomach of diabetes. Uh, this is a complication of long-standing, caused by long-standing high blood sugars that's extremely common, especially amongst type 1 diabetics. Currently, most endocrinologists say that it's very rare, but they don't know that people have, have gastroparesis because they're not closely observing blood sugars as I do with my patients. I look at literally hundreds or thousands of blood sugars every week. And one can easily tell by looking at blood sugars if a patient's on a regular low carbo carbohydrate diet, um, uh, whether or not they have gastroparesis. Uh, the pattern that we would see would be irregular low blood sugars after meals, followed by unpredictably high blood sugars many hours later. Just visualize that the stomach is turning on and off at random in an unpredictable fashion. That's the hallmark of gastroparesis, unpredictable stomach emptying, where a normal stomach uh, might empty its entire contents within three hours of eating. The paretic st stomach might empty normally uh, one day or one hour, and on another day it might ent empter empty in a totally unpredictable fashion. Uh, and when it doesn't empty predictably, usually you end up being low after the meal if you've taken insulin or a, a drug that dramatically lowers blood sugar like a sulfonylurea. <clears throat> and then many hours later when the insulin has worn off the uh, stomach finally empties and the blood sugars go go up dramatically. The reasons that uh, doctors don't spot this is they don't routinely test for it and as I said they don't look very carefully at blood sugars. Uh, the routine test that I've been using since 1983 when I first started in practice is called the RR interval study. This is a study of the vagus nerve which is the nerve that plays a major role in the emptying of the stomach. Uh, gastroparesis is essentially a neuropathy of the vagus nerve where it becomes partially paralyzed. There's, uh, as I said, there's an easy way to test this nerve, but what doctors had been doing 30 years ago and still do today, even though it's contraindicated, is the gastric emptying study where the patient is fed a meal, a soft meal, maybe chopped liver, maybe uh, uh, scrambled eggs, a soft meal that's been uh, spiked with radioactive technetium. And it's a very small dose of radioactivity. The radioactive meal goes into your stomach emits radiation that goes out of your body and can be picked up by a gamma ray camera. So the gamma ray camera takes an image of the radioactivity in your stomach and the image is repeated every 30 minutes or so until the stomach is totally empty. And there's a time frame recorded with each image. So if the stomach empties totally within three hours, you usually say there's no gastroparesis. But there's a problem. The fact that gastroparesis is unpredictable 
you can go through two, three, four, five uh, gamma ray camera studies and be normal, and then on the sixth one, have a grossly abnormal study. Now, these studies are not cheap. They're now cheaper than they were 30 years ago, but still, they cost several hundred dollars at least for a study, take about a half a day to, to perform, and uh, to do this with a patient over and over again until you get a positive study, insurance is not going to pay for it. And the patient is not going to want to be coming back over and over to get negative studies. Whereas a simple RR interval study, which I'll talk about in a moment, is cheap, easy, and can be performed in any doctor's office. In fact, it can be performed by any technician in a doctor's office. And it basically amounts to measuring heart rate variation with deep breathing. We're going to stop for a moment while I show you the difference between a normal and an abnormal study. Now the peaks on an electrocard... Well, first let me explain that this is uh, an electrocardiographic study, uh, but just of the heart rate, not really of other imperfections in the heart. And therefore we get away with what are called limb leads, just the wrists and the um, lower legs just above the ankles. So the patient doesn't have to get undressed. And we don't have to use a gel for contacts and make a mess. We use just uh, a little alcohol pad, uh, pre-packed little alcohol pads. Now, this is an RR study of a normal person, a non-diabetic. It was my daughter. And if you look at the peaks, the top line is inspiration, inhaling. And you'll see that at the start of inspiration, the peaks are close together. Uh, and uh, as soon as she stops inhaling in the middle of that top line, the peaks are further apart. And they're further apart on the second line, which is expiration. So during exhaling, it is normal for the heart rate to slow. During inhaling, it is normal for the heart rate to be rapid. Now, I'll show you the worst study I ever did, which was on a 19-year-old girl who had been diabetic for 10 years and um, had monthly visited uh, a major uh, National Diabetes Center and uh, they attributed her uh, erratic blood sugars to lack of compliance. That's what the notes in her chart said. But this was one of my most compliant uh, new patients and what I discovered was that she had unbelievably severe gastroparesis. Uh, if you look at this study, which is hers, the top lines are inspiration, the second line under it is expiration, then the third line is inspiration, and the fourth line is expiration. The intervals are all identical and very small. Her resting heart rate was 150 beats per minute. She was exhausted just being alive. Her uh, stomach would empty once a month and she would have one bowel movement a month. Her blood sugar would go up to 1500 or higher and she would pass out once a month. Uh, this is how extreme it can be. Now I showed you only a normal and the worst. Uh, everything in between also happens and those that are in between are abnormal but not as abnormal as that one young lady. Now uh, virtually every new patient who comes in here, not quite everyone, 
but certainly those who have been diabetic more than five years has an abnormal RR study. And depending upon how abnormal it is, I can tell whether or not they will have trouble with stomach emptying affecting their blood sugars. Usually dinner is the most difficult meal to digest because everybody's digestion slows at dinner time. So I may know that this person has moderate gastroparesis and that tells me that I have to be very careful about the planning of their dinners. Maybe uh, no solid foods at dinner. We might use uh, blended foods, foods going into a blender, might use um, liquid uh, protein shakes for dinner, might use um, no uh, meat at dinner. It all, it all depends. Uh, so we have to be very careful when it comes to what they eat at dinner time. Now in the extreme cases, we have to be careful about every meal and we might have to give medications for these different meals. Um, back 30 years ago, the medication that was used for gastroparesis, which is still a major one today, was called Reglan. And we used to give it in a syrup, or we used to give it by injection, and it worked quite well to facilitate stomach emptying but it had a major side effects profile. Uh, it could cause uh, somnolence, tiredness, could cause depression, um, could cause um, what are called Parkinsonoid symptoms like lip smacking or neck twitching, uh, etc. So I got scared early on and uh, stopped using Reglan many years ago. I uh, used instead uh, something called Domperidone, also a brand name Motilium, which you can get outside the USA, was never submitted for FDA approval in the USA because the same manufacturer sold Reglan, and why did they need to spend Seven, several hundred million dollars on uh, clinical trials for a product that was competitive to one they were already selling. So uh, we still get Domperidone from Canada or other uh, countries and we can even have compounding chemists make Domperidone. Um, uh, certain gastroenterologists are doing clinical trials uh, on their own and can get special permission to use Domperidone uh, as an orphan drug in the USA. But we find it easy enough to get hold of. Uh, patients can buy it directly from Canada or can order it from a compounding chemist. Um, there are other uh, agents that will facilitate gastric emptying uh, one goes by the brand name of Zofran. Uh, the generic name of Zofran is Ondansetron, O-N-D-A-N-S-E-T-R-O-N. It was originally used to combat the nausea of cancer chemotherapy, and it works by facilitating stomach emptying, making the food go down instead of up. Um, there are probably other agents on the market uh, for treating cancer chemotherapy and as they become generic like the Zofran uh, their prices will come down and indeed my patients are being paid by their insurance for using Zofran to treat gastroparesis um, we uh, insurance in the USA will not pay for motilium, uh, also called Domperidone, uh, from Canada because it's not uh, approved in the USA, 
not being officially marketed in the USA. Uh, so that's the story as far as the medications go. The dietary guidelines for gastroparesis depend on the severity. Uh, the severity can be from extreme, and in the extreme cases, uh, they not only are like the situation of the girl I just described, but they can be very painful. You can get uh, uh, GERD or regurgitation with burning in the lower chest, as I had for many years. Um, you can have all day vomiting, etc., uh, etc. Et the, the situation can be very unpleasant. But the, these unpleasant and obvious situations are, are very rare compared with just affecting blood sugars adversely because of unpredictable digestion. And the games that you have to play with meals cover the whole spectrum, as I just mentioned, from uh, ordinary meals, maybe with uh, protein reduced at dinner and increased in the morning and at lunch, uh, versus uh, liquid meals for all meals, uh, or liquid meals plus medications. It's a whole different ball game just treating ga gastroparesis. And I spend hours each week treating the gastroparesis uh, that new patients bring in in an effort uh, trying to stabilize things, get their blood sugars equilibrated. Uh, I cannot overemphasize the value of the RR study. Uh, why doctors are not doing this routinely, I don't know. Why endocrinologists who are specializing only in diabetes are not uh, having a technician do this in their office, I don't know. It's such an obvious thing to do. Uh, I did uh, write an article at the request of the editor of Diabetes Care many years ago and when I used the RR study as a diagnostic tool instead of the technetium scans, he refused to publish the article uh, say, no, saying that he was using technetium scans. And uh, the, as I pointed out before, the technetium scans are worthless uh, most of the time because you have to repeat them over and over until you get a positive study. Well, that's the story of gastroparesis. I'm sure I haven't covered all aspects of it, but it's a good starter. And uh, we'll see you at the next teleconference. Look below on the screen if you want to listen to my monthly uh, question and answer uh, teleconference. Uh, uh, it'll give you directions on how to get there. And uh, we'll see you at the next uh, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University session. Thanks for watching. The bulk of what you've heard on this video uh, appears in my book, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution, which is available at uh, most internet and local bookstores. It is published by the Hachette Book Group. I'd like to remind you that we have monthly free teleseminars every month at the site askdrbernstein.net. Doctor is spelt D-R, so askdrbernstein.net for a free monthly teleseminar. Uh, sign up a day or two in advance so that you get a reserved seat. Good luck and thanks for listening.